we thank God for another opportunity to stand before you um, tonight. And we're st uh, starting this particular subject that we have been anticipating. And I, and I need to let you know, as Pastor Flower stated, that we will be on this subject for a few weeks because we're dealing with a, an issue that is of great importance and great relevance to us today. You know, it's, it's something when you and I can look at, at the world around us and see what is going on and look at the word of God and almost read the word like you read in the daily newspaper. Yes. Yes. You can see it around you. And so we are a people that are called to be a people who walk not in darkness, but in light. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so with that, that walking in light, when, when it comes to issues that we need to be able to know the truth of God, it's important that we be a people that understand that this is the time that God has called us. This is our time. Amen. And so in this, in this particular time, what, what has been happening is there's, a, there's been a barrage in the media. There's a, been a barrage in the political stream. Right now we're in the midst of a Republican uh, primary, as most of you know. And there have been statements being made and situations. There have been posturing and things like that. And see, here's the thing. The, the church is right in the midst of this. And, and here's the thing. Also, the church has been asked uh, its, its position in the midst of this. And so we're going to look at some of that tonight in this starting tonight. And I want, you, I want to, first of all, invite you to a scripture. Pastor Flowers mentioned the scripture as he was just um, doing his intro he, earlier in his intro tonight. He mentioned the scripture. I want to invite your attention to it. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. It says in verse 15, this is the King James rendering. It says, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou artest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Now, we see there that it does not say that the political realm is the pillar and ground of truth. Amen. It doesn't say that the educational realm Amen. is the pillar and ground of truth. Amen. It doesn't say that the business realm is the pillar and ground of truth. It mentions one entity on earth, the church, yes. the ecclesia, uh -huh. the body of Christ is the only entity on earth which is the pillar and ground of truth. What is truth? Jesus asked this question. Truth number one is what God says it is. Yes. It's what God sees. Yes. It's what God knows. Uh -huh. It's the way things really are. And so we're here as the church because the church is what? It's the place that people should be able to come to get the truth, Amen. to hear the truth, Amen. to participate in the truth. Yes. It's the church. And so what has been happening is that in the political realm, there has been a barrage of controversy based on this issue of Mormonism. Now, you, you notice the subject tonight, and I, and I just want to say before we get uh, deep or into the subject, I want to say this to you. As the church, which is the pillar of truth, the church is, a, is, a, is also the pillar of love. Mm -hmm. The church is not mean. The church is not mean-spirited. The church doesn't attack people, beat people down, call people ugly names. The church doesn't do that. Amen. Now, the flesh may do that, <laughs> but not the church. And so I, I just want to say to you that we are not here because we hate Mormons. We're not sharing this subject because uh, we don't hate Mormons. In fact, we don't hate anybody. In fact, our Bible tells us not to hate anybody, Amen. but to love everybody. Amen. But here's the thing. that This idea of love does not mean that we compromise the truth. The truth can never be compromised. Come on, somebody. You, I, you, we, we don't compromise the truth in our own lives. Neither do we compromise the truth in other people's lives. Neither do we compromise the truth in a political stream. Neither do we compromise the truth in the business screen or in the educational screen. We do not compromise the truth. Amen. And so because the truth cannot be compromised, the Bible tells us that if the truth is to be known, it's going to be known where? In the church. church. 
And as, as Pastor Flowers stated, we are in a time where great controversy and great deception is all around us. But listen, this is not new. Since the very history, in fact, if you go all the way back to the beginning and you go back to Acts chapter, I mean, um, Genesis chapter three, what you find there is the same spirit of deception. Somebody coming forth and trying to do what? Challenge the truth of God's word. It's the same thing. So, so it's not like the fact that we're being picked on and woe is us. <laughs> so, the truth is the church. The church is the truth. Now, what we want to look at tonight, I have some, some video spots that we're going to look at because these particular spots give us a, an idea, just in case you've missed it, of what has been happening in the political realm. For instance, with the Republican primaries, um, uh, Mitt Romney is considered the front runner. And, and I should add, by the Republican establishment, he has been deemed the front runner. Mm -hmm. And what you have is that you have people telling you really how to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, we have nothing against Mitt Romney. This is not a political teaching. We're not teaching for or against Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. The issue that we're concerned with is the issue of Mormonism. Right. Yeah. The ism. Yeah. What is the ism about? <laughs> because, see, I'll tell you, it is the ism that is dangerous. And so we have to deal with the ism, understanding the ism. Now, what happened is that there was a, a, a pastor, a prominent pastor from uh, Dallas, Pastor Robert Jeffries, pastors, the First Baptist Church, they're a very large church. And he was uh, doing the early part of the primaries when Rick Perry, Governor Rick Perry was still in the primary. He was at the CPAC convention, he was introducing and endorsing Rick Perry. After he finished uh, that introduction of Rick Perry, he stepped off the podium, and the media that was there, they converged on him. Yeah. And when you have people sticking microphones in your face and asking you every kind of question at the same time, well, he, they asked him about the issue of this Mormonism, mm. and he had to give a response, and I and I and I and I and, and my hats off to Pastor Jeffrey because he did not he did not shudder. He spoke the truth. So we have that that particular segment. I, I want you to take a look at. Let's take a look at it right now. Southern Baptist Convention, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the world, has officially labeled Mormonism as a cult. Uh, I think Mitt Romney's a good moral man, but I think those of us who are born-again followers of Christ should always prefer a competent Christian to a competent, to an, uh, competent non-Christian like Mitt Romney. So that's why I'm enthusiastic about Rick Perry. But what do you say to those voters out there who say that, that religion his Mormonism shouldn't be an issue in this campaign. He's just as American as everybody else. Well, I agree. He's just as American as anyone else. And Article 6 of the Constitution and Mormon, And Mormons do say they are Christians. Yeah. They, they, they say that. They believe well, in Jesus Christ. A lot of people say they're Christians and they're not, but they do not embrace historical Christianity. And I, again, believe that as Christians, we have the duty to prefer and select Christians as our leaders. That's what John Jay, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said. And uh, Again, I think when we've got a choice as evangelicals, between a Rick Perry and a Mitt Romney, I believe evangelicals need to go with Rick Perry. All right. Now, because of Pastor Jeffrey's response, he was uh, invited on several uh, 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 news programs. He was queried, questioned, over and over, and I, I, would, I would also add interrogated, mm -hmm. over and over and over again about the same issue. And the buzzword word, word there was cult. Mm -hmm. He used that word cult. And that, that just set off a firestorm. Oh, yeah. How could a pastor, <laughs> a loving man of God, who loves people, <laughs> use such a word? And so what we need to do is, first of all, we need to define our terms. If you want to have understanding, you have to define your terms. So the question is, what is a cult? So let's look at that. What is a cult? 
a theological code, and that's what he's referring to there. Any religious group that differs significantly in one or more respects as to belief or practice from orthodox Christian beliefs. Now, that's not, that's, that didn't say it was a monster, right? It's saying that a cult. Here, here's um, Dr. Walter Martin, Walter Martin rather, gives his uh, uh, definition of, a, of a, a, a cult. He says, a group of a people gathered about a specific person or person's misinterpretation of the Bible. So from, from, from a definition standpoint, when you use the word cult, it's not defaming any person. It's talking about a belief system, is it not? Do you see that there? Yes. It's talking about comparing what one group believes with orthodox Christianity, or, or you could say biblical Christianity, what it says and what it states and what it believes, or what believers believe. So what you have there is simply a distinguishing, right? It's, it's talking about the differences between the two. And see, here's the thing that we as believers have to understand. This is an example of what happens when somebody, a believer specifically, speaks the truth in the public arena. Yeah, yeah. If you don't use the politically correct terminology, you set off a firestorm. Oh, yeah. And see, here's the thing, going back to this issue of the church being the pillar of truth, this is why we have to understand definitions. Yeah. We have to know what we're saying and what it means. You follow what I'm saying? Yes. Now, Pastor Jeffries understood what it meant, but the people who were interviewing him didn't know what it meant. Mm -hmm. yes. And so they had conjured up this, this diabolical, evil name that you were calling people and dehumanizing their, 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 their statue as human beings. That that's, had nothing to do with what he meant. No. He was talking about the ism. <laughs> the ism. Yeah. I want you to remember tonight, we're dealing with ism. Mm -hmm. you, understand, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you will see on, on commercials now because, and one of the parts that we're going to look at is the fact that the Mormons have, have they have generated a public relations campaign yes. that is second to none. Mm -hmm. They're spending millions of dollars yeah. they and they are, they are promoting an image. Yeah. And listen, uh, we're not saying Mormons are not good people. We're not saying they don't love their families and they don't love their, their husbands or spouses or wives, whatever. We're not saying that. Wow. We're dealing with the ism. We're dealing with a belief system. Yeah. Yeah. And see, a belief system can draw people. It doesn't matter who it draws in. It just draws you in. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to make that clear tonight that we're dealing with the issue of a belief system mm -hmm. and not in any way attacking any persons. Amen. Are we on the same page? Yes. Now, that's one pastor in um, Dallas. And this, this particular issue didn't just affect one pastor. It also affected other pastors. And I should say, Pastor Jeffries is a prominent Baptist pastor. He's Part of the one of the major uh, players in the in the Baptist denomination has a um, a very prominent position there. In addition to being a pastor, pastoring a large church. But let's look on the other side. Let's look at the charismatic side because that's the Baptist side. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the charismatic side. What do the charismatics, or I should add, what would a charismatic representative say about this issue? Let's, let's look at this next slide. Let's, let's check this out. Mitt Romney, and, and I got to ask you the question because it is a question whether it should be or not in this campaign is a Mormon a true Christian? Well, in my mind, they are. When people start talking about Joseph Smith, the founder of the church, and the golden tablets in upstate New York, and, uh, and God uh, assumes the shape of a man, do you not get hung up in, in those theological issues? I probably don't get hung up in them because I haven't really studied them or thought about them. And, um, you know, I just try to let God be the judge of that. I, I mean, um, I don't know. I, I certainly can't say that I agree with everything that I've heard about it, but from what I've heard from Mitt, when he says that Christ is his Savior, to me, that's a, that's a common bond.
All right. Now, that's Pastor Joel Osteen. And again, this is not an attack on Pastor Joel. And we have nothing against Pastor Joel Osteen. This is just an example. You have two pastors, one in Dallas, one in Houston. And you have two different perspectives. And what does this say to us? It says that as the church, because we're supposed to be the pillar of truth, there should not be two different perspectives on an issue so, so prominent mm -hmm. and so effective and so, and so has so much influence on society. There should not be diverse opinions from spiritual leadership. But, but here's the thing. You heard in this last clip, Pastor Joel Osteen made mention of the fact that he had not studied it. And, 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 and he was honest, I, 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 I didn't study it. Well, you know, it's a good thing if you haven't studied something not to answer it, right? That, that probably helps a little bit. So, so what we want to do, we want to be people who, who look deeper into the subject and do the homework and study so that we will know. Because again, the church is the pillar of truth. And so what, what that means is that as believers, when it comes to essential doctrines, such as who is Jesus Christ? Or what does it mean to be a Christian? How does one know that there is, they are a Christian? That should not be an issue that's divisive among Christians. Amen. It should be an issue that is very much unified. Right. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So what we're doing Tonight, and, and I want you to look at this particular slide. This goes back to the statement that I previously made. The Mormon church has a public relations department, probably better than anybody else. And, and I should add, this is Sandra Tanner. Sandra Tanner is the great, great granddaughter of Brilliant, uh, Brigham Young. I don't know, what's, I can't talk tonight for some reason. <laughs> Brigham Young. And Brigham Young was the second president of the Mormon church. So she goes on to say, this is a direct quote from her, and they are very careful in painting a public image that tries to make Mormonism sound about the same as evangelical Christianity, but it really isn't. I think it's kind of similar to saying that a cat is a dog. Now, this is, this is a lady who grew up in Mormonism. And after she became an adult, she began to question the ism, what she was involved in, what she knew all her life. And, she, and when she began to question it, um, she, was, she actually was, she was told to be quiet by those who were closest to her. But she was not satisfied. She still, she, she began to question and she began to study and she met actually her future husband because he was, on the, he was another, he had grew up in the Mormon church and he was also doing the same thing. And so they began to study together to try and find truth together. Of course, that caused them to get married. <laughs> but but what, what happened as a result of that is that in seeking truth together, Jesus said this, if you seek, guess what? You'll find. And they sought truth together and they found it together and it brought them out of ism into the truth and caused them to establish a, a ministry really that has worldwide influence in regards to that which the Mormon, Mormonism teaches, which is not true. They have established a ministry educating people. Her husband, uh, they've been married now for over 47 years and he's going on to be with the Lord, but she's continuing that ministry. All right, are you still awake? So I hope you can see just by the dilemma of, of, of two spiritual leaders speaking on the same subject and, 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 and then the two of them having different perspectives as to what the answers are with the, on the same issue. I hope you can see how important this is. Now let's keep going. What we're going to do in this study, and don't get scared, we're not going to cover all this tonight. <laughs> but what we're going to do these are eight subjects that we're going to cover in this study together that deals with what Mormonism teaches versus what biblical Christianity teaches. We're going to look at each one. And if you notice there, and I, I actually I got this from um, uh, Hank Hanegraaff. He used this acronym, doctrine. If you look there, you see the word doctrine. Did you notice that? Yes. 
Okay, if, you, if you're quick, you notice that. So it's the word doctrine, but we're going to cover the deity of Christ. And again, one of the benefits I believe that you will receive is that our goal is that after the study is over, you will be able to succinctly and clearly articulate the difference between what the Bible says on the deity of Christ and what Mormonism says about the deity of Christ. Is that fair? Yes. That's what we're after. Um, so again, we're going to look at the, the issue of the original sin because you'll find out Mormonism teaches that there was no original sin. When we, we talk about original sin, we're going back to the Garden of Eden there in Genesis chapter 3 where Adam and Eve both rebelled against the, the, the rulership of God. We're going to talk about the canon of Scripture. Uh, we have the Holy Bible, and you're going to find out that there are multiple bo books that are used in Mormonism that they get their, their if you will, their uh, guidance from. In addition to that, they also get their guidance from the, the living prophets of the day or the presence of the church. The issue of the Trinity is a major issue that we have to deal with. So, again, the goal here is to, after the study, have you be able to walk away and be able to share with the Mormons that come knock on your door, perhaps, in a more clear way what you believe and also have an understanding as to what they believe. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the incarnation of Jesus Christ, the new creation, eschatology. So these are just uh, subjects that we're going to look deeper into so that we can understand, okay, this is what we believe, this is what Mormonism teaches. So really, we're dealing with the subject of apologetics. Mm -hmm. Don't get scared. Mm -hmm. yeah. Apologetics. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to do what? Defend your faith. Yes. Give a reason of a, the hope that lies on the inside of you. Yeah. Why do you believe what you believe? Yeah. Being able to give a reason on that. Being able to defend what you believe. Somebody said, well, I don't like to argue. Do you know when people say that, what normally what that means is that I don't know what to say. So my cop out is I just don't want to talk about it. But see, guess what? We won't have that excuse anymore. We will be able to intelligently and clearly state what we believe based on what the Bible teaches. And listen, again, please understand. We do not hate anybody. We would never be rude or ugly toward people. In fact, here's, here's, here's the deal. Because we have been called to do what, according to Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world, preach the gospel to who? Every creature. So those who are part of isms, they are not secluded. Amen. In fact, in fact, uh, you know, I was, I was listening to... Uh, uh, quite a few testimonies of people who came out of the Mormon faith. And one, one of the things that I heard over and over again, that those who were in Mormonism and they were functioning, they said this, they said that they were around Christians, um, Christians knew them, but Christians would not approach them about their faith. And somebody, one person asked one of the Christians, why didn't you approach them? And this is the response, well, they look so together. They look so, you know, prosperous and smart, sort of like the commercials on TV. So I, I just felt, you know, they, they're okay. God forbid that we should think that way. Okay, so just lighten up. That's not, it's okay. It's all right. So in the ensuing weeks, we're going to be looking at these particular subjects and bringing about clarity so that we'll be able to understand and be able to clearly state the difference between what Mormonism believes and what the Bible teaches. Is that fair? Yes. All right. Now, I, I want to go back to the scripture because, again, when you're talking about truth, it's sort of like what, what they teach um, bank tellers. And, and Brother Dave can vouch for this. Brother Dave, you, you have many experience working in a bank. They didn't teach you guys to identify counterfeit money, did they? They taught you to identify real money, right? The other would jump up and hit you. Okay, all right. So if you know what the real is, you have no problem identifying what the false is, do you? 
So let's go back to the scripture now. Let's find out because here, here's the thing. We have to be founded in what is real mm -hmm. so that we can des detect and discern that which is not real. Does that make sense to you? Yes. So in Galatians chapter one, look at verse six. It says here, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another, another gospel. Notice that. He uses the term another gospel, mm -hmm. which means what? Somebody had brought another gospel package and said, this is the real gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Verse seven, he goes on to say, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Brothers, this, this is serious. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. And here's the thing that's so powerful about the scripture again, is that the scripture transcends times. He spoke this there in the first century, and now we're in the 21st century, and it's just as relevant. And look at the next slide. Here we're going to continue on, on this particular uh, verse, this passage here, rather, in verse 8. But then he goes and he takes us a step further. This is what Paul says by the, uh, the unction of the Holy Spirit. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be what? Accursed. Let him be accursed. That, that term accursed means to let him be thrown into hell. And, and be tormented forever. That's serious language, isn't it? Look at verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that we have received, let him be accursed. Look at the double emphasis there. So he's saying, anytime somebody brings to me another gospel or a perversion of the gospel, I'm not just supposed to just say, okay, that's okay. Let me keep eating my ice cream. <laughs> no, this is serious business. Now, now, why is it so serious? It's serious because of the eternal issues the eternal ramifications. Because if I'm believing a perverted gospel, even though I, I'm a good person and I make good commercials and I look good and I smell good and I make good money, my eternal destiny still will be lost. And see, here's the thing, they, they the, the media, referred to somebody, in fact, some, some members in the Republican established, the established Republican Party began to attack Dr., um, I mean, Pastor Jeffries, called him a religious bigot. Because he spoke truth. truth. But guess what? Don't, don't feel bad. If you speak to their call, you one too. Yeah. Yeah. But see, see, here's the thing. We have to be able to look past the name calling yeah. and understand that there's something greater at stake. Yeah. Because if I don't, if I don't reveal to you the, the truth and you are believing something perverted and you leave your body, you will go into a state where you lose your capacity to choose, to make choices. It's settled forever. Look at the next slide, if you would, please. You still awake? <laughs> in verse 11 but I certify you brethren that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man right. he's saying that the gospel that I received didn't come from man that is a critical point mm -hmm. because what you'll find in, in isms isms always originate by way of man mm -hmm. they may come by way of demonic 
uh, uh, supernatural presence, but they use a man to carry that. Paul says specifically, that which I received didn't come from a man. Verse 12, for I neither received it of a man. Notice, I mean, do you see how he's emphasizing this? For I neither received it of a man, neither was I taught it. But by the revelation, the word revelation means it had to be revealed by God. I could not have gone to school to learn it. It had to be revealed to me. It had to be imparted from God's spirit into my spirit. It's the only way I could receive it. But I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we, when we talk about this idea, and, and here's one of the things that is going to be very important in our approach. Our approach is going to be this. If you want to find out about anything, you, go, you always go back to the beginning. Yes. Do you understand? Yes. If I want to find out about you, now I can talk to you, <laughs> but if I talk to your parents, your grandparents, cousins, go back up that line. I can learn a whole lot about, about you that you won't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> and likewise, you and me. <laughs> so in, in dealing with this subject of, of, of Mormonism, if we want to find out, okay, is this a legitimate belief system? Is it in line with the scripture? Because in the scripture, what do we get to do? In the scripture, we get to go back to the beginning. Don't we? Yes. And once you go back to the beginning, then everything falls in place, doesn't it? So we're going to do that with Mormonism. We're going to go back to the beginning. Any religion, any belief system, always go back to the beginning. The historical perspective tells you, because what happens, see, and I'll tell you, in, in regards to this PR campaign that Mormonism is, is, is conducting now, one of, the, one of the, 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 the tricks, the strategies, if you will, mm -hmm. is to align with Christianity oh, yeah. and appear as though they are the same. Because in one respect, because this is an election year, you get to broaden the voting block by doing that. Yeah. You get to capture the evangelical vote mm -hmm. by doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, it's a master strategy. Yeah. It is, it is. And so people in, in current time will say just about anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you go back to the root right. of where it started, mm -hmm. how it was established, yeah. now you get the truth. Oh, come on, yeah. the light's coming on now. Yeah. So if I really want to know what somebody believes, go back to the beginning of the belief system. Now, I want you to take another look at uh, another clip because this, this next clip, um, uh, Miss uh, Sandra Tanner, again, Brigham Young's great-great-granddaughter, is going to give us some insight. This is just a clip in regards to Mormonism from its inception. Watch this clip. I want to ask this question. Ask. came up in a Pew study, a Pew poll, if you want, where the question was asked, is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, just another Christian denomination? According to the Pew Foundation, just a few days ago, of the general population, about half, 51%, think the Mormon religion is a Christian religion. 32% say it's not. Here's an interesting, interesting thing about evangelical Protestants. Nearly half, 47%, think Mormonism is not a Christian religion. One third say they think that the Mormon religion is a Christian religion. Sandra, how would you answer that question? What did the prophet Joseph Smith say about Christianity? Well, when Joseph Smith was a teenage boy, he uh, was attending different revival meetings, and these revival meetings were put on by the Baptists, Presbyterians, and Methodists, and they are specifically named in his own story of his life. And he decided he needed to be a member of some church, so he claimed to go out in the woods to pray, which church should he join? And then supposedly God and Jesus appeared to him, and he asked them which church, and uh, so this is the answer he got. He says, this is right in their, uh, 
in their books of scripture mm -hmm. uh, official, I was answered that I must join none of them for they were all wrong and the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight and that those professors were all corrupt. And that's right in their Pearl of Great Price, one of their books of scripture. And so we have the Mormons making the specific claim, all these other Protestant churches were an abomination before God. Not just a little wrong, they were an abomination before God and he was to join none of them. God was about to do a great work and Joseph Smith was going to start the true church. So in Mormonism, they are going door to door to tell you your church is not true. Now they aren't gonna directly say that, it's a, a very carefully worded presentation, but the bottom line is none of your churches are right before God, none of your ministers have the authority to act in God's name, only the Mormon priesthood is recognized by God. Yeah. Your baptism doesn't count, your pastor's ordination doesn't count, yeah. only Mormons. Yeah, they've got the fullness of the gospel, yes. which means they've got the only true gospel. Right, okay. the only true priesthood authority before God to act in his name. You know, it's, it's ironic that here they are calling Pastor Jeffries a religious bigot, yeah. <laughs> and the very belief system <laughs> that he was referring to actually believes that all Christian denominations are wrong. Isn't that amazing? But see, that's an example of what perversion will do. <laughs> they come, and again, please understand again, I need, need to, this disclaimer, we're not mad at or, or hate anybody. Please understand it. We're talking about the belief system now. Please understand that. But they come to our doors. Why do they come? They do not come because they think that you're okay. They do not come because you, you might call yourself a Christian and you think, well, I'm a Christian, that's okay. No, no. They come to convert you. Yeah. Yeah. Did you understand that? Yeah. They come, I mean, why do they come? Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't come just to, because they like you. <laughs> they come to convert you. So the whole, and see, this is a worldwide uh, proselytizing effort to convert the whole world. So th the idea that we are wrong because we speak the truth is just, look how twisted that is. All right, now I know it's getting late, so I'm, I'm, I'm speed. I can tell by the eyelids. I don't, just hold on there. All right. So as, as we move on here, look, look at the scripture here. Again, we're just interspersing scripture tonight. In Jude, um, uh, this is verse 3. You can choose your own chapter. Just... <laughs> Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now that word contend. Uh, you know, the, 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 the Greek word there, that, the Greek word means to, it's a struggle. What does that mean? It means that there's something coming against you and you have to stand. It's, it's like something pushing against you. You have to stand. It's sort of like uh, uh, it, it pushes against you, but you got to push back. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? It means that when you, when you contend for something, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be in a comfortable position right. or a comfortable posture. It means that you have to be in a position where you have to, what, stand and defend your territory. And so in, in regards to these belief systems, what has to happen is this. When we take our stand, we have to understand. I have to understand that the truth does not change. The truth does never, is never compromised. The truth is not something that I back off from. The truth is that which I speak. I speak it in love, but I do not withdraw from it. And see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The, just because we, ha we live in a society now that is becoming more antagonistic against believers. And so if you're at work or if you are in the marketplace and you get in, in, into a conversation with somebody and you speak the truth, uh, the chances are you're going to receive a backlash specifically when you hit certain social issues. So the point is, is that let's, let's just accept that. Let's understand that's just the way it is. That's the price. 
of being the pillar of truth in a world that's dark. Do you understand what I'm saying? All right. Here's another scripture, and we're coming down. This is the last scripture for tonight, I promise. 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So the Bible, interestingly, is, is understanding that there will come, he, it uses the term false teachers. What does that mean? Teachers that teach falsely. They come with a message that is false. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible declares that. And then he says, they will bring, why does it use the term, here's the King James, damnable heresies? Because what does that mean? It means that they can damn your soul. If I embrace it, that perversion can capture my soul. So the Bible declares, that's the way it is. Now, I want you to take, take a look at this last clip that we're going to share with you tonight. This deals with um, just look going back to Joseph Smith specifically and taking note of this supernatural visitation that he um, recounts that occurred in his early life that ushered him into starting this particular um, belief system called, called Mormonism. Take a look at this clip. A teenage boy named Joseph Smith Jr. said he had a vision while he was praying in the woods. According to the official account, he said he was visited in the 1820s by God the Father and Jesus Christ, who told him that Christianity had become corrupt, that all the churches were wrong, their creeds were an abomination, and he shouldn't join any of them. Three years later, Joseph was visited by an angel named Moroni. We told him where to find some golden, buried golden plates that would explain the true gospel and tell him about the history of the American Indians. These plates were supposedly written in reformed Egyptian. So he had to translate them into English, and the result eventually became known as the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Mormonism began in Palmyra, New York in the 1820s. Joseph Smith said that God chose him to restore the true church in North America and officially launched the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His followers are known as Mormons and they have taught some very interesting things, such as that if it weren't for Joseph Smith, nobody would be saved. If it had not been for Joseph Smith and the Restoration, there would be no salvation. There is no salvation outside the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Mormons get their beliefs from five main sources. The Book of Mormon, which Joseph Smith said is the most correct of any book on earth. Second, the Doctrine and Covenants, which is a book mostly about theology. Third, the Pearl of Great Price, Fourth, the King James Bible, insofar as it is translated correctly, which for the average Mormon means the Bible cannot be trusted entirely. But the ultimate authority in the Mormon church comes from the living Mormon apostles and prophets, especially the president, who is considered to be the voice of God on earth, kind of like a Mormon pope. Okay. Okay. Now, this supernatural visitation that he had three years after he had, well, he had two supernatural visitations. First of all, he claims that God and Jesus visited him. And then three years later, the angel Moroni visited him and told him that all the churches were wrong and he needed to start a new belief system. And so, if you remember, you recall this particular verse that we just looked at in Galatians. Look, notice what it says there. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes people can be deceived. The Bible talks about deceiving spirits, doctrines of devils. 
that come on purpose to deceive. And I would, I would add this, the isms of the world, if you check it out, most of them started with some type of supernatural visitation according to the people who recorded it and had the visitation supposedly. So what does it say to us? It says that number one, we're just getting started with the subject. And that's why it's so important for us to remember that we are the pillar of truth. And because we are the pillar of truth, one of the things that we have to recognize is that around us, in our time, there is perversion. There is that which is not true, that is being promulgated. And if we don't stand for the truth, know the truth, and be able to articulate the truth, then that which is a lie will thrive. And here's the thing, if we don't tell the truth, who is? And if we don't tell it, what will happen to the state of people's souls as a result of that? God bless you tonight. Thank you for Why do they call it the Church of Jesus Christ if you're so against Jesus Christ? Or is that just a trick? That's part of the PR campaign. It's part of that perverted gospel. A little hook. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pass the flowers. Well, anybody appreciate your eyes being open tonight? Yay. Yes. Uh, in, in every sense, uh, you should make sure that everybody you know is in this sanctuary next Wednesday. Because we're going to go a number of weeks with this until truth has taken hold of our eyes and the blinders come off. Now listen, let me just say something to you. Jesus said, they will hate you because they have hated me. People who are stewards of truth and are willing to voice it and are willing to live it out are not people who the world loves. So please don't think that you're, you're learning something that's going to make you a friend of everybody. You have to understand that when you come into the truth and you are able to speak truth and speak it clearly against the lie that's been pushed across the face of the media. In fact, uh, we, we were in, a, in the latter portion of our truth project and those of you who are involved in covenant community groups know that now for almost the last year we have been, we have been studying what is the truth. And how it relates to how it relates to the body of Christ and to the world in many different areas. But a phrase in, in, in one of the lessons that we were looking at last night with a with a room full of uh, young people, college and career age, and young married. The phrase last night that captured uh, my attention is this statement: "Whoever controls the media controls the culture. Whoever controls the media controls the culture." Because the media gets the message to you over and over and over and over and over again in many subtle ways. And what it does is it blinds people to the truth and causes them to unconsciously begin to follow a lie. Before, before long, you're entangled and, and don't know how you got there. But it is the truth that Jesus said that you would know and the truth would do what? it would make you free it would there is some element in the truth that is a there's a gene in the truth that's a freedom gene when you take it in it makes you free to believe and hear and see according to what God has said in his precious word make sure next week that you pull somebody into this sanctuary with you as we march through this very relevant issue for the times that we're living in, please stand on your feet with us tonight.